Amen. Good morning, Freedom Church. Visitors again, I want to welcome you. My name's Clint. I'm the lead pastor, one of the elders that do most of the preaching and teaching, uh, but I'm just one of the guys uh, that, that leads this church, shepherds this church. Um, and again, we just want to tell you, thank you for being here, uh, especially again to visitors if it's your first time. I'm really excited that you're here and, and I hope and pray that you uh, find that you feel welcomed, that you feel embraced, uh, that, that folks really are genuinely excited you're here. Uh, because we are, and so we hope that's your experience uh, with us this morning. Last night, we gathered at my parents' house in Shelby. So I'm originally from Shelby, um, and, uh, and we gathered for my sister's birthday. And um, it's, it was 28. You know, she's probably not going to be excited with the fact that I told you it was 28. Um, but it was her 28th birthday, so there's nothing necessarily special about the birthday in and of itself uh, as a number or uh, uniquely in this situation. But what was special about this birthday celebration was that her and my brother-in-law are fostering two children right now, twin, uh, twin boy and a twin girl, five years old. And, uh, and so all day, Rachel had gotten Eden and Nias prepared, who are now sick and not here, by the way, so if you're looking for them, um, had gotten them prepared to meet uh, these two precious children we wouldn't go get to meet uh, that were, had been with my sister and, and brother-in-law for a couple of weeks and, um, and kind of indefinitely not quite sure how long uh, they will be there, and so we're excited about uh, getting together to spend time with them and, uh, and didn't quite know um, what would happen. But these two children come from kind of a, a heart, heart uh, breaking scenario uh, in home life. And, and so uh, the, the folks called, reached out to my, my sister and brother in law and asked, would they uh, take these kids in uh, kind of indefinitely? And they did. And so we all get together, we're going to eat pizza and celebrate her birthday. And mom says, let's get together and, and circle up and pray uh, together in the kitchen. And so we gather in the kitchen uh, together, and, and it's a relatively small kitchen. It's a bunch of us packed in. Uh, and as we grab, grab hands to pray, I look down and see those little eyes looking at me. <clears throat> and I wonder what's going through their minds. There's a strange family they don't know. Though they feel loved and welcomed. Though they feel safe, they're scared and it's awkward. And, uh, and so we, we hold hands and we pray. And we pray to celebrate and honor Lauren's life and thank God for that, uh, to pray for the food. But we also pray for these two precious children. And I'm just wondering in my mind, what, what's going through their heads? What are they thinking uh, as they hear us pray? They've never prayed before. They pray with um, Lauren and Jesse. The little boy's off the wall. I mean, he's crazy. So he couldn't wait till Nia's got there to build blocks. And, uh, and they were in general just trying to keep him from climbing walls. Uh, like Spider-Man. The little girl is beautiful, but she was really shy and quiet and reserved. You could tell she was timid and afraid. Two precious strangers. That by the time we left, I hugged them and told them I loved them. And it was true. In just a couple of hours, seeing God in his grace and mercy and what he was doing, we fell in love with these kids. And then we loaded up the family to leave and, and come back home. And I had to go back in and hug my sister again. I hug my parents again and, uh, and just tell my sister I'm proud of them and, uh, for, the, for the hard work and ministry they're doing with these precious children. And then I drove back last night. I started to think about the similarity of the experience of the orphan or the foster kid and the experience of the new Christian when they enter into the Christian family called the church. So some orphans, some foster kids get adopted into a family. And it's a precious, sweet family that would immediately, like my sister, hugging and kissing, like holding them, treating them like their own. And they're safe, they're protected, they're provided for. And so for some orphans, that's their experience. For others, they get adopted into homes where they're abused and neglected and taken advantage of. And is this not true of the experience of the new Christian coming to the church? At some level, you step into this new family. Some of them are very loving they welcome you, they pray for you, they embrace you, they hug you, they're there for you, they provide for you. You know that, that, that they love you. But other churches, maybe new Christians step into, sometimes step into a church and you feel used. You're just a number on a page, a rear end in a seat. They don't really care about you. You feel hurt, neglected by how they treat you and you're confused because you're a new Christian. And so I was just thinking about this last night as I was looking at those kids and then thinking about uh, the way that we see this with regards to church. As a new Christian, when you're born again, you're a new believer, um, that's a scary moment. And you can go hang out with Christians and the Christians are really awkward. <laughs> and you get around them and you're like, I don't know how to speak your lingo. I don't know what I'm allowed to say, what I'm not allowed to say. 
And I think all too often Christians who have been in the church a long time forget this. And so you expect a new Christian or even a non-Christian to be in your presence and act like you do already. Meanwhile, they're an orphan or, or, or a, a foster child, somebody checking out what would this family be like, and they feel out of place. Today, as we continue our series, The Kingdom is Kingdom Following Jesus Together, we're going to see Jesus lay out what life in his new community should look like. So Matthew chapter 18 is going to give this, this picture of this is what life in the church is supposed to look like. This is what the king who is building his kingdom is building. These type of relationships and these type of interactions, this is what life in the church is supposed to look like. Matthew 18 records Jesus' fourth discourse. We've told you it's been a while since we've talked about it, but Matthew's built around five different discourses or teaching sections. So the Gospels of Matthew's built around these five teaching sections of Jesus where he would stop, he would teach, and then he would go and disciple and do stuff uh, with his disciples. And so this is the fourth one. The first one's the Sermon on the Mount, most famous, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. The second one was in Matthew chapter 10, where he prepares his disciples to get them ready for the mission and says, look, you're going to go suffer. You might lose everything, but it's worth it. <laughs> it's like, great, sign me up. So that's Matthew chapter 10. That's his second discourse. Then Matthew chapter 13, you guys remember we went through all these parables about the kingdom and what the kingdom is like. It's like a treasure hidden in the field that when you bump into it, you trip over it, you, you sell everything to have that. So get Sermon on the Mount, then Matthew 10, kind of the mission, Matthew 13, the parable of the kingdom, and now we come to Matthew 18, the fourth discourse, where he's going to teach on what the church of Christ is supposed to be like. Jesus introduced this new community called the church in, in Matthew chapter 16. So verse 15 to 18, I'll read it to you again in that interaction, great interaction with Peter and the disciples. Remember, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when we get to Matthew 18, this is the second time he's going to mention the word church, ecclesia, the gathering, the people of God. It's the second time he's going to mention it. So he said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. Matthew 18 is going to tell you the kind of church he's building. And so my prayer is we jump into Matthew 18. Just like those two children felt more and more comfortable as they were in our home last night interacting with our family. Because they felt more and more loved and more and more safe. That we as a Christian church, Freedom Church, would say we want to look at the king and what he says about what his church is supposed to be like in his word. And we would be that way so that non-Christians who come and get around us would find that they're safe. They can explore Christianity, they can interact with us, they can ask questions. They're allowed to disagree. We'll engage them. We'll talk with them. That's cool. And then new Christians will say this is the kind of family that I always hoped existed spiritually. But my experiences with church left me kind of depressed and frustrated like I'll never find a good one. But we, we would want to be one that's according to the text, according to Christ himself in Matthew chapter 18. That is my prayer as we jump in. So we'll, we'll break up Matthew 18 into two sermons. So we'll cover 1 through 14 today. Um, then in two weeks after Easter, we'll cover the rest of it. Um, so we're going we're to break it up. Usually we go right through books of the Bible. So the interesting part of, about preaching on the church is Matthew 15 through 18 ends up talking about church discipline and excommunication and some really heavy stuff. So I didn't think that would be a good Easter sermon. Um, you know, you guys, welcome visitors. Let's talk about kicking people out. Um, now, discipline is a good gift from God. And we normally would walk through books of the Bible and trust his sovereignty. And I still believe that's true. But God has also given us wisdom. I just didn't think that was very wise um, to do on Easter Sunday. So we're going to do the first half this week and the second half of Matthew 18 uh, in, in two weeks. And again, we're just looking at what, is, what kind of church is he building? What are the relationships and characteristics that should typify this new community? So I'm going to read 1 through 14, then we'll pray and jump in. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying... Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one child, one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. 
It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands and two feet to be thrown to the eternal fire. And if your eye calls you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown to the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you in the name of Christ and by the power of the Spirit asking for your help. We all come unholy, not perfect, to, you, to worship you, a holy and righteous God. But those of us who know you have rested in you, come with your righteousness and your holiness given to us freely, but still dealing with the indwelling sin that we wrestle with. And so we need your help. Those who don't know you, Christ, we pray that you would help them to open their eyes and see you, to hear the good news of the gospel, to respond in repentance and faith. Those who do, God, we pray, would, would you move through your spirit, the preaching of your word, help me just to be faithful, to say what you've said, and would you use that to bring about your will. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So four kind of characteristics or, or new characteristics of the Christian community that I want us to see. So the first one, we get a new definition of greatness. So point one, we get a new definition of greatness, verses one through four. So verse 18, verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now this is not the last time the disciples are going to ask about who's the greatest. So in verse 20, how lame is this? Their mom, a couple of them's mom, the sons of Zebedee, their mom is going to go to Jesus and say, hey, can my boys sit beside you on your right and your left? Like, can they be second in command? Just like a dude trying to send his mom to do his work, right? <laughs> trying, to, trying to find out something. And all the moms said, amen, and slap your son in the back of the head. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so there's this, this question of greatness comes up. And Mark chapter 9 tells us that basically they were, they were commuting, they were traveling, and the disciples were having a conversation, and they were arguing about which one of them was the greatest. So they're having this conversation. Again, Mark tells us that they, after they sit down, Jesus says, hey, what was y'all talking about on the road? Because he knew what they were arguing about. And you, you just kind of imagine that moment, like, ah, oh, he's got us. But since you ask... Jesus, tell them which one's the greatest. And so, I mean, you can almost just imagine this, like the, the 12 are gathered, and they've been competing with Peter's like, yeah, but you, you know, I, I said the right answer. You know what I'm saying? He asked me the Sunday school answer, and I got that mug right. <laughs> I said, Jesus, son of the living God, he said he's going to build a church on me. I'm the man. You can, no, no, but we got to go up the mountain of transfiguration. We got to go up with you. We got to see. So James and John are saying, wait a minute, we got to. So there's kind of this, this question, this argument of who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is what question comes up. They wanted to know which one of them, his followers, was going to sit at his... Who's going to be his right-hand man? So was, they're beginning to believe more and more. This Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the King. He's ushering in his kingdom, which means we're his boys, which means we're, we're, we're like important. Because we know the King. We're with him. And so which one of us is like closest to with you? Like which one of us gets some kind of title is like second in line, second in command? They're arguing as they travel. Now, isn't this just like us? We begin to grow in Christ. He begins to transform us. We get all proud and excited that we're growing. And suddenly it's like, man, Jesus, you're, you're, you, I'm doing pretty good. I'm starting to walk with you. I'm not doing some of the things I used to do. I'm, I'm starting to do things I never did. We get proud of ourselves and start asking questions about what we get out of being such good Christians. We start thinking, wait a minute, Jesus, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Now, you got some blessings coming my way, right? I'm doing good, so you send me some good. Ain't that how? We start thinking like karma. It's not even Christianity, right? We start, we start thinking, let, let, me, let, me, let me see what advantage I've got of this. Jesus, you need to be, you know, keep your end of this bargain. I'm doing good. Do, do me some good. So Jesus responds with this powerful and very, very humbling illustration. So they ask this question about who's the greatest, who's at the, the top of the food chain, who's at the top of the ladder, who's most influential, and he grabs a little child. Verse 2, and calling to him a child, he put, them, he put him in the midst of them. So Jesus clearly has a warm demeanor that's welcoming to children. And so he, he tells a child, come here, little child, come here. And the child listens to him, so he comes. 
So you just imagine these 12 grown men arguing over who's the best, you know, one up in each other. And he says, somebody bring a little child, come here. Brings this little child right in the midst of them, it says. So he brings this little child as an illustration to teach the, the disciples a lesson about what it means to be great in the kingdom. So these men who are, who are, who are angling for advancement, they're positioning for power. Jesus says, let me, let me teach you something about what greatness in the kingdom looks like. Verse 3, and he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So he puts this child right here and he says, hey, unless you turn and become like this. We're not even going to talk about greatness. Do you notice that? He don't answer greatness. Unless you turn and become like this child, you can't even get in the kingdom, let alone talk about being great. So he brings this little child and says, you, you got to be like this just to get into the kingdom. Now, a child in Jewish culture is very different from us. So in some ways, I was thinking about this last night. Um, in a lot of ways, our culture is all kind of jacked up and like kids run things and it's jacked up. Like parents should lead families, not kids lead the families, right? So, so, so in our culture, kids are like massive, kind of what they get, what they want, they get. And it kind of sets the deal. Whatever it takes to get him not throw a fit, give it to him. Like, this is how we do parenting in some ways. So we view kids as, like, a lot more important. Jewish culture, kids would have been seen in society literally as, like, the lowest rung on the totem pole. They have no power, no influence. They can't do anything on their own. They're not impressive. They can't angle for advancement. They can't position for power. They're little, insignificant people. And the, the value would be if you had a bunch of them because it made the man the man because he had a bunch of kids. But the child himself didn't have a lot of value in society, wasn't valued highly or seen as important in Jewish society. No power, no influence, no prestige, and no desire. Think about it. A child doesn't have ambition to get those things. A little child, just imagine a three-year-old. The three-year-old's not thinking, like, I got to figure out how I can get to the top. <laughs> That's like children don't think that way. Which Jesus is, that's his very point. So he brings this little child in among these men who are angling for uh, a position, trying to get in a place of power and says, unless you become like this child, you can't even enter the kingdom, let alone be great in it. So what is he saying? Now he's not saying children are innocent. Anybody who's had a two-year-old knows children aren't innocent. <laughs> you don't teach them to how to disobey. You have to teach them to obey. Disobedience is absolutely natural. No problem. They got that one down pat. So he's not saying the child is innocent and he's not saying I like act like you don't have any intellect or, or be less intellectual than you are as an adult. What is he saying? He's hollering. The child is totally dependent on the parents for everything. Utterly dependent on mom and dad to provide. Utterly dependent on mom and dad to protect. Utterly dependent on mom and dad to teach. Utterly dependent on mom and dad for everything. The child is not self-sufficient, self-reliant, or self-powerful in any way, shape, or form. The child must rely on mom and dad for everything. And so Jesus is telling these disciples, unless you turn away from self-reliance, unless you turn away from self-provision, and turn to Christ-dependence, Christ-reliance, Christ-provision, unless you turn away because you don't have anything and turn to christ you can't even get into the kingdom of heaven. Friend, have you turned away from self-reliance like a little child and turned towards Christ and trusting in Him? Have you realized you cannot do anything to get yourself right with God? So in and of yourself, you cannot fix your sin problem. But like a little child, you are helpless, turning to the Father, saying, Father, help me. I have nothing apart from you. Have you come to the end of your own strength, to the end of self-reliance? Have you admitted you have no power to save yourself? Like, I, I don't have it in me. I'm just a child. I can't do anything my parents don't take for me. So think about the picture of those foster kids with my sister and brother-in-law. They have no power to do anything apart from their parents. And so their parents in the situation they're in, now they're with complete strangers that shows how weak they are. They have no power over their lives. None. Jesus says, unless you're like this, you can't even enter the kingdom. So again, I ask you, have you turned away from self-reliance? Have you become like a child in total dependence upon 
Christ, saying to him, I can't take care of myself. If not, then like a little child, turn to him. This is the good news of the gospel. All you need is need. To become a Christian, all you need is to be sinful. Can anybody in the building raise their hand and say, I'm not sinful? If so, you're a liar, and so we just proved you're sinful. (laughs) So all you need is need. You need to realize, I can't do anything. I'm helpless. God, help me. So again, Jesus says, until you've gotten there, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine the the embarrassment of the disciples at this moment? They're probably remembering like, oh, gosh, I forgot. (laughs) We were were just humble fishermen. We were tax collectors. And here we are because we've been walking around with Jesus and we think we get to run the world and we're asking about the next seat in line to the king. We've forgotten who we once were. It reminds me of Paul uh, when he writes to Corinth. And he tells the Corinthian Christians, he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Here's what I love about what Jesus does right here. He connects their question about greatness to their conversion. So they ask about greatness, and he says, you need to remember who you used to be and how you entered my kingdom. You were a nobody. You were a nothing. You were an enemy. You were a rebel. You were a runaway, and you turned helplessly to me, and I saved you. Remember that. Jesus knows if we, get, if we forget who we used to be, we'll forget who we now are. If we forget who we used to be and how we got into the kingdom, it will change and mess up how we live in the kingdom. And so he connects. Remember who you were and who you've become by following me. So God didn't think, you know, he didn't look at you as a non-Christian and think, man, that's a good guy. He'd be really good on my team. I think I'll save him. That's not how people get saved. God looks and says, that's a rebel, that's an enemy, that's a runaway. He's flipping me off, he hates me, and I'm going after him so much so that I'm going to come for him, live the life he should have lived, then die his death that he deserved rightfully for rejecting me. I'm going to die his death for rejecting me. While we're still yet sinners, Christ died for us and rose from the grave. And so again, this is the picture. Jesus connects. When you ask about kingdom greatness, don't forget about who you were when you came to know him. And then finally, verse 4, he answers the question, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I just love this. You start asking Jesus, well, how good am I getting as a Christian? How great am I? He reminds you of your conversion. He says, okay, no, no, okay, you're forgetting. You got in, you came in humbly, but you're starting to get proud. Let's remind you of who you were when you came in. Because the same way you entered the kingdom is how you grow in the kingdom. Like a child who says, Jesus, I can't do anything on my own. I'm utterly dependent upon you to grow me in grace, just like I was utterly dependent upon you to get me in to grace. And so he's he's reminding them, you want to be great in the kingdom, you be humble. Humble himself like this little child. So to angle for advancement, to position yourself for power, is literally to forget how Christ's kingdom works. So to think I'm climbing up the ladder is to think backwards about the kingdom because Christ turns the kingdom upside down. You want to go up? Go down. You want to be great? Serve. You want to go high? Get low. I mean, it's just, he literally flips the whole thing upside down. So everything you've learned about how to advance in business, literally upside down. You want to be great in the kingdom? Clean toilets. He just says, be a servant of all. And is this not what Christ said that, that he, he is? So we find out just a little bit later in chapter 20, Jesus says the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. Greatness in the kingdom comes through humility. So you want to be a beast in the kingdom, then depend on God like a little child. That's what he's teaching. You want to be a beast in the kingdom, lean on Jesus like you're just a little child. And so again, he's redefining what it means to be great. And is this humility not what we saw Michael preach last week? That Jesus is the Savior who stoops to save. If we're going to be Christians, Christ-like, if we're going to follow him and he's stooping to save, we'll probably be stooped down with him. 
This is what it means to be great in the kingdom is to serve and to be humble. If you, if you want greatness, do you not look to the greatest? If you want greatness, do you not look to the greatest? Think about it. We're watching March Madness right now, right? Duke won. Carolina lost. I just had to say it. I had nothing to do with the sermon. Let's move on. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Um, <clears throat> that's just bad. Darren, I'm, uh, Darren, Darren Devine now is not listening to the rest of the sermon. I, that's, I'll, forgive me, Lord. Darren, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, but seriously, if, if you want greatness, do you not look to the greatest? Does every little kid playing basketball, even though now they never watched Michael Jordan play, say, I'm trying to be like MJ? We, or at least LeBron now, right? Like, we, we know we're going to look at the great ones because we're going to become like them. Well, friends, if you look at the great one, Christ himself, he came to serve. You want to be great, be humble, serve. The king of the universe washed dirty feet. That's what greatness looks like in the kingdom of God. So again, this is Christ redefines greatness. So life in the faith family has a new definition of greatness, namely humility. So in the church, in a healthy, true church, greatness is defined by humility, by those who want to serve. Great people are people who don't want to be great in the kingdom. Great people are those who don't care about getting some kind of name for themselves or positioning for some kind of power. Great people are those that Jesus, I can't believe you saved a wretch like me. I just want to know you and make you known. Whatever that looks like, that's what I want to do. This is what the faith family is supposed to look like in the kingdom. Those who are wholly dependent upon God as they live in the kingdom. Just as they entered the kingdom, they live in the kingdom. So we entered humbly, completely dependent upon Christ, and now we live humbly, completely dependent upon Christ. So new definition of greatness. Secondly, new source of justice. So secondly, as a faith family, we have a new source of justice and even protection. So when you come out of seeing we're utterly dependent, leaning on Jesus like children, does that not leave you feeling a little bit vulnerable like those uh, foster kids at my, at my house, at my parents' house? Man, if I lean on Jesus like a little child and I trust in him alone, I'm not like fighting for myself. Does that not leave you f- kind of a little bit like I, I, I feel in danger? Um, I, I feel exposed. I feel like a little child because that's the goal. Do, do, do you not feel unsafe? So I, before we move on, you need to understand some people have misinterpreted some of this passage because what Jesus did with the child was use the child as an illustration. So he brought the child and said, disciples, you need to be like this little child. Now, when he moves on the passage, when he says child or little, little ones, he's talking about the disciples. He's not talking about children. So now he's talking about Christians. And we, this, is, this is nothing new. He's done this all throughout the book. He talked about the little ones who will come to him humbly. And so he's using the child as an illustration to talk about Christians. So here's he's speaking about his disciples, not literal children. Verse 5. Whoever receives one such child, namely one that has humbled themselves like this child in the midst of us, one of you disciples who've done this, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, so there again, there's another sign that he's talking about Christians, disciples, these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of sea. Man, Jesus does not drop warm and fuzzies, does he? <laughs> I didn't mean to rhyme there, but there you go. <clears throat> this is intense, right? Like, goodness. So he says, hey, anyone who receives these little ones, it, meaning you guys who lean on me like little children, illustration, anyone who receives you receives me. Anybody who don't is coming for him. It'd be better for him to have a huge stone tied around his neck and dropped in the, in the the middle of a great sea. And so Christ lets us know, like this is what he said back in uh, chapter 10, verse 40 and 42. Whoever receives you, receives me. Whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. And whoever gives one of these little ones, again, disciples, even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he'll by no means lose his reward. So Jesus is saying, I so identify with my children. Like, I've come to represent the Father to bring you to the family, and I'm telling you to depend on Him like a little child, and I want you to know as you're scared and vulnerable, I so identify with my people. What they do to you, they do to me. So don't worry. I know everything they do to you on account of me. Is this not what he says to Paul or Saul in Acts chapter 9? So Saul's been killing Christians, having them drug off to be killed for being Christians. Road to Damascus. When the resurrected Lord shows up, interacts with Paul, 
What does he say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting Christians? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting the church? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because what you do to them is what you do to me. And so Jesus is showing us in this moment. He told them that and he literally shows up and, and gives a picture of it with Saul. And so what do we see from this as Christians? Our faith family has got to be a family who has a new source of justice. We know our king has got this. And so whatever is done, is done wrong to us, one of two things will happen. Like Saul, God will pour his wrath out on Christ instead of Saul and make Saul into Paul and use him in great ways. But every injustice that Saul did was paid for in full on Christ on the cross. That's one thing that happened. So anybody that persecutes or hurts us as we're leaning on Christ, totally dependent, God might save them by pouring out his wrath on Christ instead of them and change them, give them a new heart. Or he will crush them forever in eternity. And so there's no need for us to worry or try to avenge ourselves as Christians. So Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14 to 21, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So the faith family realizes our king has got the justice part taken care of. And so we don't have to fear. We don't have to be worried. When, when people receive us, they receive him. When they reject us, he promises, I'll take care of that. They hurt us, I will take care of that. Love your enemy, pray for them. Encourage them, feed them if they're hungry. That God might make Saul's into Paul's. And if not, his wrath will be fully pulled, pulled out, poured out upon them. Now, I want to interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon program uh, for a second and address one awful phrase that I would love to never hear again uh, from Christians. And everybody's going to feel guilty because we've all said it. So just get ready. We all, I mean, you pull your toes back if you want, but we're all going to, we're all going to feel it, right? So people, somebody's giving you a hard time. They're even persecuting you for your faith. Just kill them with kindness. It's a ridiculous phrase. Kill them with kindness. How about you just be kind to them? Why not drop the kill part? Because the kill part still displays, I want my own vengeance. And so I'm just trying to kill you by being kind to you. That's as selfish and moralistic and as wicked as if you were just wicked to them. No, how about we let vengeance belong to the Lord and not seek to kill them, but instead pray for them? How about we encourage them? We point them to Christ. We share the gospel with them. And then we trust, Lord, you will either kill them, meaning they'll put their faith in you, they'll die with the Lord Jesus, or in eternity they'll reject you and they'll get their punishment. So there's no need to kill them with kindness. Let's just give them kindness. As we've been given when we were very enemies with God ourselves. Paul says, no, overcome evil with good. <laughs> That's what you do. So don't kill them with kindness. That's not good. <laughs> overcome evil with good. Just show kindness. And at some level, you can't do this because you're sinful and you want to kill them with kindness. And knowing the smirk on Eddie's face, he just wants to kill him, period. <laughs> so this Lord Jesus, where do we get this power to do this? From the gospel, right? Jesus, you should have killed me with kindness. As a matter of fact, you should have killed me with just wrath. I was your enemy. I was a rebel. I was a runaway. I was against you. I lived for me rather than living for you. And instead, you loved me, and that brought me to repentance. And so we say, Jesus, I can't love them with kindness when I'm angry at them, but you can. Would you give me your grace and love to give to them? And this is what it looks like because we have a new kind of justice. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. His wrath is more than sufficient for those who persecute us. So how about we pray that he would absorb God's wrath for their sin, just like he absorbed the wrath that we should have gotten for our sin. And let's not stop there. Let's preach the gospel and love our enemies, uh, hoping uh, that his justice will look like them being converted and saved, just like we have been. So again, 
New definition of greatness, new source of justice. Thirdly, a new enemy, namely the sin within. So thirdly, uh, what Jesus now tells us to do in the church, so there's a new definition of greatness, it's humility. There's a new source of justice. We trust the Lord to take care of those things when we're mistreated. And then thirdly, he says, now there's a new focus of your energy on what enemy you should be going after most violently. It's the sin within. So you want an enemy to fight, go after the, the remaining sinful indwelling sin, is what people are, indwelling sin still in you, the ways that are not submitted to Christ. So he calls us to love our enemies and turn our violent sin killing on the enemy within us. So let's be more concerned and, and bothered by the sin in our hearts and the sin in our membership than the sin outside the church. This, uh, this is what we should do. So we should not be angry at non-Christians for living and thinking and believing like non-Christians. That's foolish. They're not Christians. No. Those who have the Scriptures and have the Spirit of God who aren't living like the Spirit of God is convicting us to according to the Scriptures, that's where our energy needs to go. On the, on the sin within. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 very clearly when he's talking about church discipline. He says, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you're to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So Paul tells us the sin we should be most upset about is first the sin that we see in our own hearts. Secondly, the sin that we see in the body. And so we've got to help each other, encourage one another, dive into it and gently, lovingly, kindly confront one another in our sin. Because this sin is the one we're supposed to go after. So verse 7, woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. So Jesus says, look, woe to the world for temptations for sin. It's a broken world. It's necessary. Redemption's got to happen. The fall happened, which means sin goes to Adam and Eve and to every other human being. Sin has infected everything, including you, including me, including your favorite pastor, preacher, most godly grandmother, whoever. Like sin has infected everything. So temptation will come in the world and woe to him by whom it comes. But it's necessary. Because I'm bringing forth redemption. In verse 15 to 20, again, it's going to tell us a little more specifically about how to deal with it in, in house. But verse 8, he turns it. He says, look, woe to the world. I know the world is broken. I know it tempts you to sin. I know it's much easier to sin than it is to walk with God. I know that's the case. But verse 8, and if your hand or your foot calls you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. If your eye calls you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown to the hell of fire. This is a near repeat of what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 29 and 30 in the Sermon on the Mount. He said almost the exact same thing. Now he uses hyperbole. What is hyperbole? It's just exaggeration. It's a literary art form to display and communicate something. So again, as I said when we did Matthew 5, I really don't want a bunch of you guys to show up next week like with no eyes and no limbs, okay? That's not, Jesus is not saying literally mutilate your body. He's using hyperbole. What is he saying? What is he teaching? Whatever it takes for you to kill the sin in your life, do it. Kill it violently. Whatever it takes. Now again, it's just a, this is exaggeration. But, but don't water down the point. Don't water down the point of when he's saying... Literally, cut, pluck out your eyeball if that's what it takes. Cut off a hand if that's what it takes. So again, he's not talking about literally, but he is saying in your life, whatever it takes to kill the sin and temptation in your life, do it. So some of you, you're in a relationship and you cannot be in it without sinning. You should break up. Very clear. Pluck it out. Cut it off. Very simple. Some of you can't get on a computer without going to websites you shouldn't go to. Get rid of the computer. Put it in a public place. Get Covenant Eyes, the software that sends an email to your buddy letting you know what websites you're looking at. Whatever it takes, cut it off. This is what Christ is saying. You want to be angry and violent about sin. Stop being angry and violent about the sin out there and look at the sin in here. And do whatever it takes to kill it. That's what Christ is telling us. Some of you can't watch TV shows without being elicited to lust or to be discontent or to get angry, or to get jealous. Stop watching them. Now, others can watch the same shows without being tempted towards those sins, but you can't. So stop. 
So this is where we always want to ground the do's in the truth of the gospel. But we cannot be afraid to say the do's. Christ died for you. He bought you with a price. You do not belong to you. You belong to Him. If there's sin that's trying to lead you down to death, it is better for you to get rid of something and have life than it is to keep it and die forever. The logic is crystal clear. He loves. He says this is better for you. But my friends will think I'm weird. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown to eternal fire. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown to the hell of fire. It is better to have friends who think you're weird than to burn in hell forever. That's what he's saying. It's just better. It's better to go to heaven where you'll have a new body or you're this body renewed anyway. With your eyes and your hands and your back, which mine is already not working right. Like You're going to get a new body anyway. You're going to get forever. So nothing here that keeps you from life there is worth it. Get rid of it. Be violent towards the sin in your life for the sake of your life. To do whatever it takes to murder the sin in your life. Make war against it. Destroy it. Suck the life blood out of it. Whatever it takes, do it. John Stott's helpful. He says it's not mutilation, but mortification is the path of holiness he taught. So now again, he's not telling us to cut hands off. He's saying kill our sin, whatever it takes to kill our sin. Paul, same thing, Romans 8, 13. You live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. So Christians, the phrase is always, we're dying to live. We're dying off the old sin and old man in order to have new life. That's just the Christian life. The Spirit convicts us, shows us new sin. By the Spirit, we put it to death because we're already saved. We can't lose salvation. We're already saved. We put it to death and we move on. And we have more life in Christ. John Owen, you guys have heard me quote this a number of times. You must always be at it while you live. Do not take a day off from this work. Always be killing sin or it will be killing you. So again, this is Christ is clear. This is evidence of conversion. You seek to kill sin in you. Now before we move on, I just want to make clear. And this is a sober moment. Judas is in the circle listening to Christ right now. Judas is looking the King of kings and Lord of lords in his face. And he's greedy. And he's going to betray him. So just because you're in church, if you have no desire to kill sin in you, no evidence of fighting sin in you, you should have no confidence you're a Christian. If you're not bothered by your sin, you probably don't, you don't have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is bothered by your sin. That's why you have the Spirit, to be bothered by it and then to have the power to kill it. Live according to flesh, you'll die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It's why we fight sin in our life, because it's a real threat. <clears throat> so in this new community, new definition of greatness, new source of justice, and new enemy, namely the sin within. So in a community where violently killing sin within and seeking fight against temptation of the world, where do you find rest and confidence and assurance? Because I'm exhausted just talking about it. So where do you find rest at this moment? I, I, I love where he takes this. Verse 10. So fourthly, last point, new rest. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus says you need to make sure you don't despise or look down the low, on the lowly, humble Christian. The ordinary Christian who's just trying to get by and they're fighting with big, bad, nasty sins, but they're fighting. And they got a bad background. Embarrassing sin in their life, but they're fighting. Jesus says you don't despise these lowly, humble ones. Don't look down on them. Let me give you a reason why. One, I see them and love them. Two, I got angels who stay before my face helping them. That's how much I love them. I'm helping them in the fight. So where do you find confidence? You find confidence knowing that God who's sovereign over the angelic realm is sending forth angels to do work to help you fight. And it's good news to know that our God loves us. <clears throat> so he's talking to his disciples, the humble little ones that believe in him. And, and real quick, this is the one verse where people run with the whole guardian angel thing. Um, they take this and say every little kid has a guardian angel. In context, clearly it doesn't work, right? They're not talking about little kids. We're talking about disciples, Christian disciples. Now, all throughout the scripture, we do see that God uses angels to minister to us, to help us, to make us strong. We, like, he uses angels. The scriptures don't necessarily say everybody has one guardian angel. And for goodness sake, they do not say that when 
somebody dies, they become an angel and they're now your guardian angel. Humans do not become angels when they die. It's, un- it's a pagan deal. It's not a biblical deal. Humans don't become angels when they die. And so, yeah, you don't have a guardian angel that's a lost loved one. So they're either in the very presence of paradise with God or not. They're not an angel. Humans don't become angels. So again, I just say those things to try to tweak it as you go through the scriptures and realize I've been told these lies over the years and just kind of assumed they were true, but the scriptures correct them. But what do we know about angels? Psalm 34, 7 through 10, listen to this. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. God cares for the lowly, humble saints. And so so much so that he would even send angels to help minister to you. And then verse 12, he says this beautiful parable. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go search of the one that went astray? If he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So where do humble, vulnerable, sin-fighting little ones find their ultimate rest? We enter the kingdom by ultimate dependence on Christ. We've just seen we walk and grow in greatness in the kingdom by ultimate dependence on Christ. And we will go with him forever and be held in his kingdom by ultimate dependence upon Christ. So you see this beautiful picture, this this parable. He says if there's 99 and one goes astray, what's the Father going to do? He's going after him. I want you guys to imagine if Nias went missing, my son, my four-year-old son went missing. I would not stop until I found him. I would search everywhere over and over and over until I found him. And then when I found him, I would rejoice more over that than I would the fact that Rachel and Eden were safe. Why? Because I love Nias more? No. Because my family is not my family without Nias. We are not us without him. And so Jesus gives this picture and says that when a saint, now Luke 15, he's talking about a non-Christian, but right here he's talking about a Christian. When a saint, when a little one goes missing, God says, I'm going after him because we are not us without him. So God the Father runs after us. So where do we find rest in the Christian life when we're fighting sin? Knowing that you can't get away from him even if you want to. He'll send angels after you. He's not going to lose you. It is not the will of my Father who's in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Not one gets to perish if you're in Christ. Not one. You cannot perish if you're in Christ. And this is where we find our rest. This is where we find our comfort. Freedom, this is why we take church membership so seriously. This is why we have you sign a covenant when you join. Because the God of the Bible is the God who comes after saints who are running away. And so as decent Christians, when we notice a saint, a Christian hasn't been here four or five weeks, we should be alarmed and we should go running after them. And I'm not talking about in the judgmental like, I ain't seen you in church in four or five weeks. That's garbage, fake, pharisaical, legalistic. You're bragging yourself. That's garbage. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about tears in our eyes. Brother, sister, I'm concerned about you. Four or five weeks usually means there's more sin going on. I love you. I care for you. How can I pray for you? How can I help you? How can I get you back with the body? Because we are not us without you. This is just basic Christianity. This is healthy church according to Jesus. This is what it looks like to be faithful. That's why biblical churches end with verse 14. It's not the will of my Father that any one of these should perish. I love that. Not the will of the Father. Did we not learn the Lord's Prayer? Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God, the same thing you do up there when you go after straying saints, would you help us do that down here? Because it's not your will that they would perish. So we know that's not your will here, so we're going after them. So we we show care and concern for one another. Jesus in John 6.39, This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. John 10, 28, 30. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. Satan cannot touch you if you're in Christ. That is good news for the Christian who's fighting sin. You cannot be taken away from him. This is good news for the Christian. 
Okay, again, you guys know I'm going to wrap up with some rap lyrics. I love Christian hip-hop. And uh, that's crazy to people. And amen, it is. It is what it is. People are crazy, and I'm a people. So there you go. <clears throat> KB in a song called Doubts. When he says, look, I'm supposed to be this Christian, this leader, this musician, thousands all over, all over the world learning from me. But if I'm honest, I'm doubting. If I'm honest, there are good days and there are bad days where I doubt you. I doubt your love. I doubt who you are. He says this, but then the spirit comforts me. I ain't got to worry about this no longer. When I feel my grip about to slip, his grip on me is stronger. When I can barely crack a smile feeling like Mona Lee. God says, no, you're weak, so when you're strong, you know it's me. See, he's been saving since Abram, and he ain't lost one yet. Jesus has set me free, never seen a better sunset. That's why I doubt my doubts. That's why I doubt my doubts, because they just push me closer to the one who's got it figured out. This is good news for the Christian when you understand assurance. We can rest, because he will never let us go. So while we were enemies, Christ died for us. He made, his, made himself vulnerable. He died the death we deserve. He lived the life we should have lived. And in so doing, he puts us in this new family called the church, this new community where greatness is redefined, where our source of justice transfers, where, where we're, we're suddenly in this family together, loving one another, serving one another. So non-Christian, I just remind you, all you need is need. Turn to Christ today. Become like a little child and cast yourself upon him. He can carry you. He can take you into his kingdom. You'll get there no other way. Christian, church, may we, may we live out the kind of church that our king leads. May we love one another gently, pray for one another, encourage one another. If I go missing for four or five weeks, y'all are going to notice it, and that's going to be awkward. But if I go missing for four or five weeks, come after me. Not in judgment like you're better than me because you got more stickers on your coat because you've been to church more often. That's ridiculous. Come after me because you love me and you're concerned about my soul. If you've noticed members of Freedom Church, if you know members who haven't been here in a while, go after them because you love them. This is not just an elder pastor thing. This is a Christian thing. Reach out to those who are missing. And then let's rest in childlike dependence on the one who will never let us go. That is good news. He's never let us. We're about to sing a new song. Um, and and it's, it's not a new song uh, in when it was created. It's new for us. Um, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. That's just a good place to end. We can rest fighting our sin, walking together. That God has saved us, placed us in a family to fight together, but we can rest. Nobody can get us out of his hands. He'll never let us go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you, Christ, that you died for us, that you are the perfect example of what it looks like to submit and be utterly dependent, though you were dependent on, you needed to be dependent on none. You were the king. Yet you relied perfectly on the Father, submitted to the Father. You lived the life we should have lived to get to heaven that we did not live. Then you were crushed and crucified for all of our rebellion, all of our angling to get a position, to get greater glory for ourselves. You died, you were crushed for our sin that we keep running back to again and again and again. And you rose from the grave. And in your rising, as we will celebrate next Sunday, we have confidence. Satan lost. Sin lost. The broken world lost. Jesus won. If we're in you, we win. And so we, may we now just celebrate in the fact that you'll never let us go, that you're faithful, that we can run to you, and therefore being secure and safe.